The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Now about eight days after saying these things, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep. But since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent in those days and told no one of any of the things that they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then, a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly, a spirit seized him, and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. Begged, I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions, but Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Some of my fondest childhood memories was my activities with the Boy Scouts of America. I was very fortunate to be involved with a troop who insisted on camping at least once a month regardless of the season. We would spend sometimes, especially during the summer, entire weeks out in the woods with these old, musty, American army surplus tents that smelt of canvas and campfire smoke. It was either rain or shine, sleet or snow. We were out there. But those tents that we had were nice. It protected us. When we were in the tent, I remember many times we'd be in the tent and it was raining and we just listened to the raindrops on top of the the canvas. Or wake up in the morning and see insects or bugs or spiders on the outside, their reflections outside, knowing that we were safe inside. There's something about living in a tent. Just even for a little bit, uh, it brings joy to my life. You're not indoors, but you're not outdoors. You're in the wild. You know that you are counting on yourself and those with you for survival. The sense, for me anyway, is hard to describe because you have this freedom, this peace, this adventure all rolled up into one. And throughout scripture we read different times about uh, tents. Since the beginning of time there's been this sense of mobility. Not necessarily staying in one place but continuing to move from one place to another. Adam and Eve, when the world was created, God dwelled, was was with Adam and Eve in the world. Different communities throughout the Bible would travel, and and home for them was wherever they set up their tents. One of the words used in the Bible for, for this is tabernacle. Over and over again, we see how God uses shelter as a temporary place to dwell. For example, when Moses was leading the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt to freedom to the promised land, it was 40 days or 40 years they lived in the wilderness, dwelling in tents or tabernacles. And they carried with them the ark of the covenant, a vessel holding the 10 commandments and other physical signs of God's presence with them. This movable temple or tabernacle 
is where God dwelled with them. God lived among them, just like God lived among us in the creation story. Jesus came into the world to physically be with us, and his home was wherever he laid his head. He spent his life ministering to others, and he was with three of the disciples on Mount Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John. Suddenly, Jesus is transformed before them. His face is radiant. His clothes are dazzling white. And there Jesus is talking with Elijah and with Moses. Both Elijah and Moses are known for meeting God on mountaintops, having these mountaintop incredible experiences, speaking with God face to face. Where we live, where we find and dwell with God. This week, as a community of faith, we start our journey with family promise. People who are coming here in this place to find shelter. A place to lay their heads. A place to call home, even if it's just for a week. Today, we are providing for them an opportunity to be transformed through support, through the relationships that we build with one another. God will speak to them as God speaks to us, as God spoke to the disciples. The message that God speaks to us is that God desires freedom and life for all of God's people. That God is with us and through us all things are possible. That God loves us as God's children more than we could ever imagine. That God will do absolutely anything, including dying on a cross, to communicate God's love to us. And this is something that I think Peter understood on that mountaintop when he saw this heavenly sight, when he saw the transfiguration of Jesus, and when he saw Moses and Elijah standing there, and he saw that and said, I want this. I I need this in my life. So let's make these three tents, these three dwelling places. We, We experience the greatness of God. We want to keep and hold on to that experience. Let's make these three tents and keep that here with us. Given thousands and thousands of years of history, when God shows up, you build a tent, a tabernacle, something to encompass that experience so it's forever with you. So Peter feels the presence of God. Peter sees this wondrous sight. He he knows that just six days before this experience, Jesus made this prediction. You will see the Son of Man in his kingdom before you die. And suddenly this prediction has come true. The kingdom has come. The Messiah is here. So Peter puts up these dwelling places, these tents. Because that's what you do when God reveals God's kingdom. Peter is overjoyed because finally... Everything that Jesus said, everything they experienced is coming to pass. But suddenly, just as quickly as it came, it's gone. No more heavenly light. No more voice of God. No more Elijah or or Moses or, or dazzling white clothes. All of it's gone. And it's Jesus, Peter, and James, and John on the mountaintop. Jesus says to them, now it's time. It's time to go down the mountain, go in to the valley, make our way to Jerusalem so I can die. The kingdom has come, but it's a price that Jesus pays for our behalf. And it's such an unusual thing that we can barely comprehend what it means. 
Jesus says to them, tell no one what you have seen until after I have come back from the dead. We have places in our life where we want to build our tents. We have experiences where we say we have, we have truly experienced the presence of God. We feel comfortable, we feel confident in, in what we have done, what we have experienced, what we have said. We want to build that tabernacle, that tent, and let God dwell in that space. God is active there. And we are afraid that if we move on to something else, something different, maybe God will not be there anymore. Like, like Peter experienced, maybe suddenly, as quickly as that came in our life, if we change, if we do something different, if we move away from that, maybe God's not on the other side. So we will do anything, anything to make sure that God does not go away. We feel like in that experience, we have been saved. So when we talk about what we are doing as a congregation, when we talk about who we are, as we see things change within our faith community, that might scare us. That might tell us, well, we're not sure we want to move to that other side. We're not sure we want to do that because what if it's not the same? What if we don't experience God in that new space as we once did in that old space? But if we believe that God has a plan for us, God might be saying to you, to me, to us as a congregation and a community, let's go down that mountain together. Let's make our way to the cross. And during that time, there may be things that we experience, hurt or pain or suffering or even death. But the promise that God gives to you and to me is that God is waiting for us on the other side to bring us life and resurrection. What are the things in your life that you do not want to change? That you have declared sacred and holy. That you have said, this is something that is so important to me, I will do anything to keep it as it is. Whether it's in the church, whether it's at home or at work, wherever it may be. And what is holding you back from making the change that you think you might need to make? To help you move forward in some way. Siblings, today is a day of transfiguration. It's the turning point in our year together as a church. We have rejoiced in the expectation and the the birth and the life and the ministry of the Messiah. We have marveled at what he has done for the people of God in this world. We have begun to realize the power and the authority Jesus has. But now he makes his way to the cross. And we start the season of Lent, where he begins to reveal his suffering, his compassion, and sacrifice. It's time for us to journey with Jesus down the mountain, into the valley of the shadow of death, into the 40 days of Lent. We will put away our alleluias. We will put away those things that, that mark our life outside of the Lenten season until our Lord is risen from the dead on Easter morning. Together we will take this journey with God. Thanks be to Christ who dwells with us. Amen.